Normally, uh, this uh, topic takes 75 minutes, so uh, we're going to move fast, as fast as we can, and see if we can shave some minutes on this, and uh, that means that I need you to listen fast, too. Can you do that? It, is there such a thing as listening fast, you know? Um, so we're going to move uh, with alacrity. And uh, let's, uh, let me just pray one more time so the Lord can be with us on this. Father in heaven, as we learn this morning, we are in Sabbath school time. We want to ask your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds and to help us understand some of your nature and some of your ways with us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We're going to talk about conditions and hindrances to a spirit-filled life. Let me begin with a story that uh, I first heard at a general conference uh, session in Indianapolis many years ago. I hope you're planning to go to San Antonio. Every Seventh-day Adventist ought to be at a GC session, at least one in their life. It's not like Muslims going to doing the Hajjah in, in uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia, but it's almost that way in the sense that uh, it, it gives you a real sense of uh, perspective when you sing, um, you know, uh, lift up the trumpet with 60,000 other people. It, uh, so I encourage you to do that. And the following one will be in Indianapolis again in 2000 and, uh, what are we, 2020, uh, unless the Lord comes before that. Gauhun Tse was a common laborer who had become a Seventh-day Adventist four years before, but he didn't know how to read or write, and he had a poor memory. Somebody had given him a Bible when he was baptized. He didn't have family in the interior of China, small villages, farming. And um, so they read the Bible to him, but he couldn't remember. He couldn't remember the Scripture. He had a great love for other people. He, he had come to understand how God had saved him and how God had reached out to him. And so he wanted to share that with other folk and, and, and just couldn't find a way to do that. How could he share the love of Christ with others if he couldn't even read the Bible, let, let alone tell them what it said or, or, or recall some of these things? And so one Sabbath, he decided to pray and pray until something happened. He said, Lord, I am not going to leave here until you give me assurance that you're going to be able to use me for your glory to share with others. And so he longed with, for God with all his heart. After a few hours, he heard a voice. And the voice said, read Psalm 62. Now, we're not going to go into Psalm 62nd, uh, 62 today, but it's a beautiful psalm that has very clear connotations. It makes sense once you really understand that in the Hebrew as to why God said that. Of course, God knows Hebrew, and so he told him, read Psalm 62. And he argued, and he said, I can't read. And so God said a second time, read Psalm 62. And so he took his Bible and read Psalm 62. He was so excited about this. You know, Chinese characters are among the hardest things to read anyway, okay? Um, he ran to, across this village to meet with the, pa the elder. And he says, Elder, the Lord taught me to read. And then proceeded to repeat Psalm 62 by memory after having read it just one time. So the Lord can take care of things, can he not? That year, the missionary that told that story used to live out here. He worked for many, many years, and if I mentioned his name, many of you would recognize it. He saw him, he, he personally talked with this man, in the first year, he said that the first year, he brought 180 people to the waters of baptism, this man, on his own. And then he was a catalyst for between three and 
hundred um, miracles of healing over the next few years in his life. A man full of the Holy Spirit because that day he decided to say, I'm not going to move out of here. I'm not leaving until you bless me, until you do something in my life. You know, there are seven stories in the New Testament showing how and when the Spirit was poured out in somebody. Let's review them very quickly. Three of them have to do with a post-conversion experience. Acts 2, the 120 in the upper room, they were already followers of Jesus, were they not? They were disciples of Jesus, and yet they received an outpouring of the Spirit, a very significant outpouring of the Spirit, at Pentecost. The early apostles in Acts 4, they were leaders in the church, and yet after two of them were released from prison, they came in among that leadership group, decided to pray together, and the Bible says that they prayed for boldness, and the place was shaken, the Holy Spirit fell on them, and it was shaken. The third time is the Samaritan believers, after they were converted, they were baptized by water, and then Peter and John came from Jerusalem, as I mentioned yesterday, when they put their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. So they already were converts who received uh, the Spirit of God as a post-conversion experience. But then you have other stories. You have other stories of concurrency. You have the case of Jesus, who when he was baptized, he received an outpouring of the Spirit of God. You know, upon the shore, after, upon being baptized, he went to the shore, prayed, and the Spirit of God descended on him as a dove. Or in the case of Cornelius and his household, when Peter was preaching, and when he came to the point of the cross, Calvary, that's when they received the Holy Spirit. So that's concurrent with conversion, with surrender. In the case of Paul, the apostle, when he was converted, you know, on the way to Damascus, three days later, he received the Holy Spirit. And finally, in the case of Acts 19, the Ephesian believers, when they finally understood Jesus' ministry, because they were followers of, they were disciples of John the Baptist, they had not understood, they, evidently they had left Palestine before, they, before Jesus was crucified, therefore they never fully heard that or understood that, when Paul explained that to them, they surrendered to Jesus and they received the anointing of the Spirit of God. Why do I tell you this? Because 700 million Christians, a full, one out of every three, and if you're technical, it's probably one out of every two practicing Christians, believes in what is known in theology as second blessing Theology. What's second blessing theology? Second blessing theology says you are surrendered, you accept Jesus Christ, and then sometime later you receive the Holy Spirit. It's a subsequent experience. And the first three of our seven examples would seem to say that. But that is taking a superficial uh, view of what Scripture teaches. The truth of the matter is that, and then some people say that you can only receive the Holy Spirit if somebody lays hands on you. Well, look at these seven, the seven experiences I just told you about. In the first one, there's no laying of hand. The second one, no laying of hand. The third one, no laying of hand. The fourth one, yes. The fifth one, yes. The sixth one, no. The seventh one, yes. So you don't see a consistent formula. You don't have to necessarily lay hands on somebody for them to receive the Holy Spirit. That is immaterial. It may be other reasons why that happens. I'm telling you this because many people really believe this. Having done superficial study of Scripture. Remember, the book of Acts tells us stories. Okay? And when you try to interpret stories in the Bible, you need to be more careful that when you interpret straight teaching in the Bible. What do I mean by that? Take, for instance, the letters of Paul. The letters of Paul, Paul says, do this, 
do that. God says this. God says that. In the Old Testament, you have the, the prophet saying, God says this. God says that. That's clearer teaching, right? In other words, the, the danger for misinterpreting that teaching is a little bit less than hearing a story and then making theological conclusions from that story. Well, the book of Acts is all about stories, and a lot of the charismatic friends we have in the Christian church mostly center their theology on the stories. Therefore, it is easier for them to misinterpret theology, misinterpret what the Bible says based on the stories. And that's why one out of two basic practicing Christians in the world today believe in second blessing theology. But that is not what the Bible teaches. You see, the Bible teaches that other people were also baptized. For instance, Philip, Stephen, Barnabas. But they were, there was no supernatural phenomenon. In all the, in the seven cases I gave you, there is supernatural phenomenon. You have either, you know, uh, tongues as a fire or, or shaking or uh, noise or the scales fell off somebody's eyes or something like that. And so many people assume that the only way you know that you have received the Holy Spirit is if something supernatural takes place. And sometimes people pray and earnestly pray and pray and pray until something happens. You know, the pressure that... Uh, charismatics have because they believe, theologically they believe that the only way you receive the Holy Spirit is when you are able to speak in tongues. And that is the mark that God has finally smiled at you. Well, there are some people who go several years, two, three, four years agonizing week after week after week in church because they can't speak in tongues until they do. You may say, how do they do that? The mind is a powerful thing. If you believe this is the only way to save your skin, if you believe this is the only way God will be pleased with you, yes, you will end up speaking in tongues. Which are not tongues. When then is the Spirit given? According to the Bible, while Acts has the, the Spirit's activity through stories, it is in the letters of Paul that most clearly we can learn the nature and the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, the chapter that speaks more about the Holy Spirit is not in the book of Acts. It is Romans 8. It is Romans 8, 16 times. The, 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 it, the Holy Spirit is mentioned there. Here's an example. Romans 8, 9. Look at how clear this is. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. He's not Christ's. What does that mean? That means that second blessing theology is, is, is inadequate. That means that whenever you accept Christ, you get the Spirit. That's why you accept Christ. It is concurrent. It is something that happens every time you say yes to Jesus, you're saying yes to the Spirit. Every time. Not sometime subsequent where you need to wait until something supernatural takes place. No. Every time you quietly even say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is coming into your life. That's the teaching of the New Testament. Paul leaves no doubt as to when the Spirit comes, when a person is baptized with the Spirit, whenever you accept Christ in your life. And that is why sometimes it's confusing because of the nomenclature we use. Baptism is a reference to initiatory experiences. That's why when a person becomes a Christian, he is baptized, right? Right? And you don't expect that person to be baptized 1,500 times during their experience, right? It's an initiatory experience. In other words, baptism is the start of your Christian life. You're supposed to keep growing from that point, right? Sometimes we get confused because we, 
We use the word baptism, the baptism of the Spirit, when we should use the word infilling of the Spirit. What's the infilling? That is something that you need, you need, to, it's, you need to be filled with the Spirit time and time and time again. Whereas you can only be baptized once, as it were, you know, theologically speaking. Here's an example. A very well-known text, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when Jesus, I mean, when Peter um, responds to, on the day of Pentecost, he's finishing his sermon, not quite finished, and people don't let him finish, and they say, what must we do? You know, they're under conviction, right? They're deeply under conviction. It says, what can, you know, we get it. Now, what can we do? And this is his answer. Repent. Let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Charismatics say that is a, an appeal for water baptism. And they would be correct in the sense that the Bible elsewhere talks about that the, the baptism by water is the baptism of forgiveness. But what they forget is the rest of the text. The rest of the text says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it is meant to be a package deal. You're baptized in, in water, symbolizing the fact that you have surrendered, that Christ has come into your life, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And that is the reception of the Holy Spirit when you are baptized. It is not something that takes place Five years later, 10 years later, 15 years later, when you become holier. First, we're baptized when we first believe. Then we're filled time and again. That's why Paul said that to the Ephesians. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the Spirit of God. Part of the confusion is, with Adventists is they read Ellen White who uses the terms interchangeably. Actually, between the New Testament and Ellen White's writings, there are 32 expressions that mean the same thing. Uh, but that takes some study to, to process that. She did not differentiate between the terms baptism and the clear term infilling. Sometimes she should have, to be technically correct, she should have used the word infilling instead of baptizing, uh, but she didn't. You know why? Because she used uh, Methodistic language, and she was used to what the Methodists, like, that's, that's how Methodists talk. They always use the word baptism regardless of what they meant by it. And she was, you know, that was her, her background to begin with. So, this to say that everyone receives the Holy Spirit every time you say yes to Jesus. That's the bottom line. You don't need to wait for something supernatural to take place. You don't need to wait until something special, you know, so that you can feel the Holy Spirit. You need to believe. You need to take God as His Word and then, and then uh, function accordingly. Now, what hinders us from receiving the fullness of His Spirit? Listen to this statement. It is not because of any restriction on the part of God that the riches of His grace do not flow earthward to man. If the fulfillment of the promise is not seen as it might be, it is because the promise is not appreciated as it should be. If all were willing, all would be filled with the Spirit. So what is, she, what is her implication? The implication is that the reason we do not see more of the Holy Spirit in our lives or in our churches or in our families is not because God is holding back. It's because we don't want it. It's because we're not ready to appreciate that. It's because we, it's because, you know, as Wilbur Reese once said, many of us want $3 worth of God. Put it right here in a paper bag, and I'll carry it along with me. In other words, we don't want the fullness of God because that is almost a frightening thought. What if God really, really comes in His fullness? I mean, the changes would be so 
dramatic that I am afraid, I, you know, it's like it's going to mess up with my life, you know. And there's something very human that says, I want to still have some control of my life, right? Don't we not do this? I do. I give God and I surrender and I pray and I ask Him to change me and so forth and so on. But if I'm really serious, and some days I am, I recognize I'm not really willing to give up everything. I'll give up most. But I want to have some go-to mechanisms, you know, a little medication that we use. So, when, so when, when we want to do what we want, we can. I'll mention four hindrances today. Primarily, I want to talk about conditions that would... Um, facilitate the reception of the Spirit in our lives. But I'll mention these four quickly. One of them has to do with secondary concerns. We as Christians many times have secondary concerns. We worry about minor stuff. She puts it this way. The promise of the Spirit is a matter of little thought of, and the result is only that what might be expected, spiritual drought, spiritual darkness, spiritual declension and death, minor matters occupy the attention. How many times that's the case? You know, a, a very good example would be a typical church board agenda. And I know and I expect most of us here belong to church boards. You know, some days we spend a lot of time on minor matters, right? And we wonder why our meetings take so long and our results are so, so feeble. Because we're, our, we're on our own on this. You know, we've, we've, you know, we're spending a lot of time on secondary issues. We, in our lives, you know, our priorities are not the priorities they need to be. And so, therefore, we, we keep the Holy Spirit at bay. We, we do not allow Him to do His full work in our lives. I think that was the case with Ananias and, Saf and Sapphira. When you really see that story, remember reading that in Acts 5, they thought it was a minor thing. You know, everybody, they, the Holy Spirit was working in such amazing way. Everybody was giving up of their possessions, lands, houses for the case, for the works. You know, these people, they were, they were like, okay, they were thinking like Jesus is going to come back in six months. Let's, let's give it all to him, right? But, but these guys, this was really counterintuitive based on the experience at that time. When they decided to lie, and they decided to say, yes, we're going to give all of this, but in reality, they're keeping part of it. That was counterintuitive at a time when everyone was giving everything to God. So it was really, you would say, well, wouldn't it be quite uh, laudable to give part of your property to the church? Not when everyone else is giving all of their property to it. That's not as laudable. You know, and so they, they were aware of that. They were lying. They were, you know, they were trying to look good. But you know what Peter says, and I, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? The Holy Spirit was moving in a very, 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 very clear way, and so the, the, everything was heightened. Everything was heightened. A second hindrance, pride and self-reliance. Ellen White speaks about the people of God have accustomed themselves to think that they must rely upon their own efforts, that little help is to be received from heaven. She speaks on this in the context of keeping the Holy Spirit at bay. Because they can do it. So they're not in full surrender. I think the case of Saul is a good example in the Bible. Saul was the king. But Saul knew 
that the person who was really in charge was Samuel because he was the prophet of God. And, uh, but after he was a king for a while, at the beginning, Saul was okay. He was humble. He was obedient. But after a while, it got up to his head. And since he was a tall guy, it really went up. And everybody started treating him. You know, that's one of the problems with kings. If you read Genesis 10 and stuff, you know, the early, the first king, it, the wording is, is tragic. It's like this is the first king. It's like how bad can human, the human race be that they would choose somebody to be over them? That's what kings do, right? That's anomalous. That, that's, that's, that's not normal. That's not good. So it went up to his head, and he started taking prerogatives that not even kings should take. And, uh, you know, he thought he was very important. Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God. Thus he, reje that he has rejected you from being king. And later on, you see the demise and how the Holy Spirit has left Saul. Because he thought too much of himself. He, he, he it, it, much like, like the devil, he just thought he was somebody. Pride and self-reliance. That'll keep the Holy Spirit away. A third one, a critical or a vengeful spirit. In councils on stewardship, we read, an indwelling Savior is revealed by the words, but the Holy Spirit does not abide in the heart of him who is peevish if others do not agree with his ideas and plans. Scathing remarks grieve the spirit away. Bleh. I have, that's, that's for me, that one. Um, you know, we professors profess, and, uh, and we're supposed to know things, right? That's, that's what our job is. And uh, sometimes that really gets us because we think we know better. And then we criticize other people. And we, and we diminish, even if not in words, in mind, in thought, in attitude. That is a hallmark that the Holy Spirit is not working in our lives. We grieve the Holy Spirit when that happens. And that also hinders the Spirit's work in our lives. Judas was that case. Judas was critical. He, he looked down on everybody, including his di own disciples. He was the only Judean. There is good evidence based on my personal studies. There's good evidence based on Matthew 8 that he was a scribe. Ellen White says that what the scribe said in Matthew 8 was Judas. That's, what, that's, that's the encounter with that Jesus had with Judas. So he was Judean, he was a scribe, he was somebody. The, the other disciples were lesser. That's probably why he carried the bag. He was the treasure. He was the smart one. He was the one that had connections in Jerusalem and so forth and so on. That's why they pressed Judas onto the circle of the twelve. They said, this is an important person. This is somebody. Well, it problem was he was not really truly converted. And so, he, was, he admired Jesus, and he had a soft spot for Jesus. But, because he was not fully converted, he thought he could do better than Jesus. When Jesus would not proclaim himself as king, when he would not do some of the amazing things he could do for his own benefit, so Jesus, Judas decided to put him in a corner to force him to be the great man that he was. But he, was, he had a critical spirit, even of Jesus. And when Mary Magdalene washed his feet and so forth, he was critical. Who, you know, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, not that he cared for the poor. It was for show. So he betrayed Jesus hang himself, rejected the Holy Spirit. And the fourth one, intense amusements. 
Now, I'm going to dwell on this a little bit longer because this is a 21st century issue. I believe that was, I'm suspecting that was the case with the Philippians because that's what Paul tells the Philippians in Philippians 4, and you can read it in Philippians 3 as well. He gives the example, I've left everything behind to follow the Lord Jesus, and then in 4 says, you know, keep your minds on what is good and noble and, 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 and truth and honorable, etc. Keep your mind on these things. In, uh, in the book, Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, a remarkable statement, many have turned away from God's plan to follow human inventions to the detriment of spiritual life. Amusements are doing more to counteract the working of the Holy Spirit than anything else. And the Lord is grieved. She said that over a hundred years ago. What were the amusements at that time? Playing chess, playing cards, going to the theater. That's about it. What would she say today? When our amusements are in the palm of our hand, in our cell phone, when our amusements are with our laptops, Adventists no longer need to say, I don't go to the theater, because the theater is back home now. You know, it's, it's accessible through Internet, right? And everything else. She says that does more to counteract the working of the Holy Spirit than anything else. Wow. Now, I want you to think seriously about this. Listen to John, uh, John Piper, is an evangelical theologian and pastor who is very prolific. Every year he, put, he puts out two or three books. The guy just writes, but he has some very good things to say. Listen to this one, In Hunger for God. The greatest enemy of hunger for God is not poison, but apple pie. It is not the banquet of the wicked that dulls our appetite for heaven, but endless nibbling at the table of the world. It is not the X-rated X -rated video, but the prime time dribble tr of triviality that we drink in every night. He was referring to television. For all the ill that Satan can do, when God describes what keeps us from the banquet of his love, it is a piece of land, a yoke of oxen, and a wife. In other words, secondary things. The greatest adversary of love to God is not his enemies, but his gifts. And the most deadly appetites are not for the poison of evil, but for the simple pleasures of earth. For when these replace an appetite for God himself, the idolatry is scarcely recognizable and almost incurable. We don't perceive it. I am a recovering TV holic. I'm not proud of this, but I, you put a tube before me and I just get transfixed. And I'm nearing 60 years old. I've struggled with this with many, for many years. So to the point that when our children were little, and I, two, I saw two or three, my, our children now are in their 20s, you know, 28, 26, 24. But when they were little, two of them were just as transfixed as me. They got my genes. And one day I said, whoa, what am I doing? So without consulting with the family, I got rid of the TV overnight and just announced it. I thought the kids were going to claw, claw out my eyes, you know, but they didn't. Precious, precious, your kids are resilient and, and they, they can change faster than any of us can. And you know what happened? Two things happened immediately after we got rid of, rid of the TV. The kids studied. <laughs> what a concept. You know, after school, they actually studied instead of watch TV. And secondly, we had consistent family worship. We had family worship before, but it was sometimes inconsistent because they, a, a show had to finish. What are we going to do when we get to heaven? It says, you know, Jesus, just wait a minute. Let me finish my show. A number of years ago, there was a study made of the average American's discretionary time in 75 years. How do Americans spend their time except for work, discretionary time? 24 out of the 75 years, they're sleeping. 
Makes sense. About a third of our lives. Four years standing or waiting in line. Four years eating. I know some who would exceed that by quite a, quite a bit. <laughs> Half a year in the bathroom. I also know some people that would probably <laughs> exceed that by quite a bit. Half a year of physical activity. There's something wrong with this picture. You know, half a year in the bathroom, only half a year of physical activity. The one, but if you add that up, that up it, doesn't get, it doesn't get up to 75 years because what we're missing is 13 years of TV watching. When the study was done, Internet was not... Internet was here, but it was not as well developed. And, Nobody could get movies and stuff like that in, in TV. You know, I travel, I fly a lot, about 120,000 miles a year. And, I, and because of that, I get upgraded a lot, not because I pay for it, but because they want to keep me around. It's just, you know, that's a good customer. And my colleagues who actually pay for those seats and are movers and shakers in industry, in commerce, in government, I'm thinking sometimes they don't have a life. Either they're working or they're watching some stupid, stupid thing on their little, you know, screens. I can't believe, it just boggles my mind how they would download all this stuff so that they can watch it while they're traveling as if that was so important. I can't miss this. The father of American psychology was William James, and he made this sta statement. The drunken Rip Van Winkle, if you know literature, you understand that this guy used to get drunk all the time, every day, in fact. In Jefferson's play, excuses himself for every fresh dereliction by saying, I won't count it this time. Well, he may not count it, and kind heaven may not count it. In other words, God may forgive us. But it is being counted nonetheless, Nothing we ever do is in strict scientific literalness wiped out. And that has been proven not just by the social sciences, but it's been proven time and again. Our brains are such magnificent pieces, you literally never, everything that has been imprinted there, everything you have heard all your life, everything you have seen all your life, every, every sense you've experienced, it's all there. The fact that you and I cannot recall it at will doesn't mean it's not there. I remember reading about a, 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 an experiment done with a woman in her 30s, late 30s. She listened to, to a, an, a, a, a symphony 17 years before, only one time. They put her on these electrodes and whatever it is, you know, she was a musician. She was able to reproduce the entire symphony after having heard it only one time 17 years before. That's the power of our mind. So good input means good things, but bad input, it's there. It's there. And it affects us one way or the other. So that's why amusements, be very careful about that. Be very careful. I'm not saying you should just <clears throat> get rid of everything like I did. You just need to pray about what, what is best. And you need to, you know your battle, if, if you have any. My wife is, you know, that's not her battle. She can take it or leave it. But I have a battle with that. What conditions are given for the reception of the Holy Spirit? I want to mention eight of them and uh, go through seven of them quickly. And then to this afternoon, we'll, we'll concentrate on the eighth one. Number one, deep repentance, Acts 2. We read it. Repent and let each of you be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But that repentance, what is the context of that repentance? What, what was Peter speaking about to that audience that came for Pentecost? He was telling them that they had crucified the Savior. No anesthesia. I mean, talk about a preacher, your first sermon, and saying, by the way, you are all guilty of killing such and such. 
Now, that's not the best way to make friends and influence people, isn't it? And yet, well, because they, he was being led by the Holy Spirit, and it, it, it was very clear they were being convicted. They said, what shall we do? Yes, we're under conviction. We did this. So the context here is the cross. The context is Jesus and what he has done for us. So repentance is repentance, not about this nilly-willy stuff that sometimes we, we went through when we were six or eight and, and knelt up by uh, our bed with our mother's presence saying, Dear Jesus, forgive me for everything I've done today. It's a very specific, I killed you. I have done away with you. I have rejected your grace. I have rejected your great love. For I need to understand what I have done against my Savior. And you know what? That is one of the things that the devil works very hard to keep you from understanding. The cross is something every Christian it's, it's common, well understood, but it's not well understood at all. Most of us have a fairly flimsy understanding of what, what the cross means, what it is. Some years ago while I was teaching here at Southern, our offices were in Miller Hall. I was a young professor at that time, late 30s, and... Uh, I went to do some research early on, about 5, 4.30, 5 o'clock, I went to the office before anybody else was going to be there for another two or three hours. And I read a statement by in Desire of Ages that caught me, just, just caught me. I had read that statement many times in pages 755, 756 on the chapter on Calvary about what Jesus had done for me, what he had done for me, for you, she says, for you, he did this, for you, he did this, for you, he did this, for you, he put up with that, for you, he did this. And that day, for the first time, for some reason, I finally got what that meant. I understood that Jesus did not simply die for the world. I understood that Jesus simply did not die for all of us sinners. I understood that Jesus died for me. For me, as if I were the only living being in the universe. That my God, the God of all things, the great loving God, died for me? And I cried out and I said, why, God? Why do you love me so much? Who am I that you would love me so much? Who am I that you would want to sacrifice so much for me. I started sobbing and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. I was reduced. I, you know, I fell on the floor. I couldn't stop crying. I was literally overwhelmed by the love of Christ. And this, this state of, you know, lasted for some 45 minutes. I saw the love of God in a way that I had not seen it to that point before. And I, I, I just, there came a point where I stopped uttering words because it seemed to me that the presence of God was so real, I was even afraid of opening my eyes to see him there. And so I thought, knowing that he could read my thoughts, I prayed in my mind and I said, Jesus, if you keep showing me more of your love, I think I'm going to explode. I'm going to, I won't be able to take it anymore. Hold back. If anybody has an experience like that, what do you think is going to be the next step? Is it going to be for you to be just as selfish as you were before? Just as interested in your things? As in just as willing to put God in, a, you know, in your to-do list, but you know, as number 15 or 20? The natural response is total surrender. 
It's like, Lord, I don't know what you have seen in me that you would even care to save a sinner like me. But if there's anything you can do with me, I am yours, totally yours. I'm complete, I don't care. I don't want to do anything on my own. I just want to bring glory and honor to you. That's the repentance I'm talking about. A repentance that fully understands what we have done to repent from. And that can only be seen the more you see, uh, clearly see the grace of God. And we can only see, then clearly see the grace of God the more we are exposed to that grace of God. The more we, we, we see that, the more we, we, we explore that and we examine that and we think about that and we keep that in our minds and meditate on it. The repentance. The word is naham, literally to sigh to long for change, to fully see one's guilt and sin, to recognize God's purpose for us and how far we've fallen from it, to yearn for a decided turnaround cost that cost what it may to de determine that we shall be different. That is repentance. It is not this frilly thing that says, oh, please forgive me, without really fully understanding what what it cost. A second condition is implicit trust. In Galatians 3, we're told about that. Paul speaks about this. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? The implication is by hearing with faith, right? So we should receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Again, this is a variance from many from charismatic theology that says basically, no, you know that you have received the Holy Spirit when you see something supernatural take place. But the Bible teaches that we receive the Holy Spirit by faith, whether we see something supernatural or not. We take God at His word. We just, we just count on it, right? Ellen White has a, a very, very, very useful insightful statement about the difference between faith and feeling in the context of the reception of the Holy Spirit. Listen to her. Feeling is not faith, she says. Faith is ours to exercise, but joyful feeling and the blessing are God's to give. True faith lays hold of and claims the promised blessing. That's a reference to the outpouring of the Spirit. Promised ble the blessing is what Methodists called the outpouring of the Spirit. It was called the blessing. Um, True faith lays hold of and claims the promised blessing before it is realized and felt. Here is faith, naked faith, to believe that we receive the blessing even before we realize it. When the promised blessing is realized and enjoyed, faith is swallowed up. But many suppose they have much faith when sharing largely of the Holy Spirit and that they cannot have faith unless they feel the power of the Spirit. See, that's what charismatics Believe. They need to feel this. But if you feel God, why would you care to need to know Him? Now, I want you to, I, I'm pausing, you know, put a little clause right now. I think about that, and this is happening more and more among Adventists today. We want to feel God's presence. And much of our worship service is being led, directed that way. We want to feel God's presence. If I feel God's presence, you know what happens? I think I know God, and I'm not prompted to want to know Him anymore. Why? Because I already feel Him. But you see, you see how much we are set up? We, we can be set up for deception. If I feel Him, I mean, that's a part, the most powerful thing is senses, right? And so if I feel God, I don't need to know God. One time... When I was a pastor, I was giving a Bible study to a charismatic who told me exactly that. He says, I can see what the Bible says on this subject, but I don't feel it is necessary because the Holy Spirit has not told me I need to do that. And I kept arguing, I says, well, but the Holy Spirit actually is the author of this book. 
He is telling you to, yeah, but I don't feel that that is right. You see the subtle deception here? Feeling God can be a wonderful thing, and it can also be a very dangerous thing if it will lead you to stop right there. Because all then you will want is to feel Him again. And the devil can make sure you can feel like you are getting close to God. But it's only knowing Him that will make a difference, not feeling Him. So she says, such confound faith with the blessing that comes through faith. The very time to exercise faith is when we feel destitute of the Spirit. So when you feel destitute of the Spirit is when you need to count on God's promises. Because that's what God said. That's why it's so critical for us to know our Bibles. It is so critical for us to know our Bibles. A third condition is obedience. And this is simply, simply the other side of the coin. Is it a little chilly here? Yes, you can. Mark, I don't know if you can talk with the powers that be, but I felt that it was a little chilly here. Um, I'm okay because I'm walking around and talking, but I don't know if maybe there's nothing that can be done about it. But uh, you might want to talk with the folks that run the place. Um, obedience, the other side of the coin. We are witnesses of these things, Peter said, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to who? To those who obey Him. So you trust and obey, for there is no other way, as the song says, right? To be happy in Jesus. In other words, if you really trust God, you will obey Him, right? There's no dichotomy. And if you obey Jesus from the heart, it's because you're actually trusting Him. Very simple. A fourth one is a burden to share. In Luke 11, uh, uh, the, that story will give us two of the conditions. The first one is a burden to share. You know the story in Luke 11? Jesus was praying and the disciples saw him praying and says, oh, teach us to pray. Now, did they not know how to pray? Of course they knew how to pray. They've been doing that for, for years. And they've been with Jesus for nearly three years when they asked that question. So they knew how to pray, except that they didn't know how to pray like Jesus prayed. In other words, when they saw Jesus pray, they said, boy, we're missing something. And so Jesus repeats, this is Luke 11, he repeats the Lord's Prayer from Matthew 6, except that he misses four lines when you compare them. Why? I believe, my personal conclusion, is that he's eager to tell a story. He's, telling, he's going to tell a parable to illustrate what the issue is. And the story is about a man who lands in his friend's home at midnight. Remember the story, right? And in Oriental lands, you could not live with yourself unless you presented something to eat to anybody who came to visit you. You, can't, you don't send them to bed without eating. That's, you know, that's like, what's that, you know? But the guy has no food. So what does he do? He goes to his neighbor, knocks on the door, and says, you please give me three loaves because I have a man that came to me now. And, you know, I, oh, I can't live with myself if I send him to bed like this. You remember the story? Friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me on this journey. And I have nothing to set before him. So I said, this is what Jesus said, to ask, it will be given you. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? In other words, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for others. Who ask to be empowered to bless others. And that's the key. If you want to ask to, to become a blessing to other people, that is a condition the Lord will pay attention to very closely. The word in, 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 um, in the Bible is the Amharets. These are the people of the land. Most of the people were very poor people. Regular people, they lived in houses that were no bigger than this platform, okay? Two floors. The, the, the two floors were about a foot difference. The, the higher level was where they slept. The lower level is where they cooked, if they cooked inside and where they kept the smaller animals, like chickens. 
They didn't have doors. We have doors. Palaces had doors. Big places had doors. People's homes had no doors. Not in those days. They barred the entrance. And so they put the equivalent of a, a four by eight, whatever it is. They, they barred the entrance. And so that's why when the man comes at midnight, the man inside says, uh, you know, come tomorrow. I'll give you everything you want. Because right now I've closed that door. It's like... You want me to get up now and take tear this thing down? The chickens are going to start clucking and my kids are going to start crying and all kinds of things. This is going to be a mess. Tomorrow I'll give you everything you want. Right? They had a, a, a window that was about this big. No bigger than that because they had to keep animals and thieves away from getting into the home. Evan Roberts, the catalyst, got used for the last worldwide revival, historical last worldwide revival, which is the Welsh Revival, 2000, I mean, 1905, so this is over 100 years now, when he was convicted that he needed to really share this in the Lahore community where he used to, where he was from, he said, I felt ablaze with the desire to go through the length and breadth of Wales to tell of the Savior. And had it been possible, I was willing to pay God for doing so. That's having a burden to share. That's having a burden to share. That is, Lord, I'll do anything so that you give me an opportunity to be a blessing to others. That is a burden. That is, that is the indictment. That is the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in that, in that person's life. The Holy Spirit will come to all who are begging for the bread of life to give to their neighbors. So that is a good gauge for us. Am I really concerned for my neighbors or my co-workers or my friends or my family member who do not know, who may not know what I know about Jesus? Am I so concerned to, about them that I'm begging God for His power his instruction, his grace, in order to be a benefit to others. That's a condition. A condition coming from the same story is persistent intercession. And that is what, uh, the, what Jesus lauded the man for. He said to him, I say to you, regarding the neighbor's refusal to give him bread, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. His persistence. The word in Greek is gall. It's brutal. It's like, I ain't leaving. I am not, I'm going to tear down this, this door until you come out with the goods. And the neighbor caught on to that. He says, you look, you're, gonna, you're not going to quit, are you? You're just not going to quit. Until I give you the, okay, all right, I'll give you. And Jesus commends that. That's persistent intercession. And there are some times and some days when we are going to need to do that because for one reason or another, things are being blocked, whether it is ourselves. Something in our hearts, you know what Psalm 66, 18 says, if I... I'm sorry... I probably didn't. Okay, I'm not going to touch myself anymore here in my chest. Um, so, um, those of you who didn't sleep well last night and we're sleeping right now, good morning to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, the man will give him anything that is needed simply because he's not going away. Jesus says, do the same with me. If I'm not giving you something you need, there's a reason for that. Don't give up on this. Don't, don't come to me three times and say, okay, you know, nothing has happened. Therefore, I'm moving on. If it is my, my will to give you the Holy Spirit, as it is, it is my will to empower you to reach out to others, as it is, 
if it is not happening, something else is taking place that is unseen to you. You need to stay with me until I'll work that out. Corrie ten Boom. You know, her family uh, took care of Jewish people in Holland. She was hauled off to a Nazi concentration camp. Her sister died a horrible death there. She was able to forgive the Nazis. Later on, she teamed up with Brother Andrew in smuggling uh, Bibles to uh, Russia and the Eastern uh, European countries under communism. Every once in a while, they met with some very difficult impediments. Um, it, it just wasn't working. So they would get together. And the group, the leader group, and they would pray. And an eyewitness tells us this about Cory Ten Boom. Well, actually, uh, Brother Andrew tells in the story, and uh, what's the Bible, the book, it's a great book. It's called um, In God In God what? In God Changed Its Mind. That's the book. In God Changed Its Mind. That's really worth uh, reading. And he says this about her. He says that she would, you know, evidently they used to pray in English because there were other English speakers. And as you know, English speakers don't learn other languages, but other people link, you know. So they were all, you know, praying in English. In her accent, Lord, you must do something. There's no time to waste. She would quote God's word to him as if he didn't know it. Like a lawyer, she'd find the exact passage to prove her point, and then with her Bible up in the air, here, Lord, read it yourself. <laughs> that's gold. That's bold. That's beautiful. Do you think that God is offended at that? Are you kidding me? No. He probably elbows other angels and says, did you listen to that lady? <laughs> now, that's somebody who is counting on me. Am I not going to do what she's asking me? You bet I'm going to do that. Martin Lord Jones, the great preacher, British preacher, he says, you will find this same holy boldness among people whom God had used in revival. This putting the case of God, pleading his own promises, Oh, that is the whole secret of prayer, I sometimes think. Do not leave him alone. Pester him, as it were, with his own promises. Tell him what he has said he is going to do. Quote the scripture to him. It pleases him. God is our Father, and he loves us, and he likes to hear us pleading his own promises, quoting his own words to him, and saying, in light of this, can you refrain? It delights the heart of God. The sixth condition, to honor the body temple. Sometimes I believe that there are people who are really good people, honest, great Christians, but this might be a hindrance. And the Bible points that out, 1 Corinthians 6. The body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Do you not know that your bodies are members of, the, of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. So immorality is a big issue. And you know what? Today is a much bigger issue than it was when people had to stop at a, you know, a dirty magazine selling place. Again, because you have it right there in your computer. It's, it's one of the biggest problems among, pornography is one of the biggest problems problems among Christi in Christianity today. And among the people that are most affected are pastors and leaders. As was mentioned earlier, pastors live a fairly lonely life. A lot of pressure. And I could give you some more statistics about seminaries and, and so forth and so on. This is an issue a greater issue today than it was a generation or two ago. Flee immorality, Paul says. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. 
Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you're not your own, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So if this is the experience of anybody, it will be a major hindrance to the Spirit of God in your life, and the condition is to be free from this, to be free from this. The Epicureans who lived at the time of Paul, they used to teach the greatest good is the prudent pursuit of pleasure and the absence of faith, the of pain. Then the, the ultimate result of that was hedonism, which is the pursuit of highest ple- the highest pleasure for the body. And that was considered the highest good. And many people in, 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 in Greek culture believed that. And at the time of, Christ, uh, of Paul, they believed that. Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Corinthians is the second largest city in Greece, where the Greeks used to teach this. So it was a real issue with the Corinthians. But the teaching of the New Testament is very clear. Fear God, give glory to Him. Glorify God in what you eat, in what you drink. That reveals who your God is. Uh, Glorify God in your body, since it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. In Jude 19, those devoid of the Spirit follow after ungodly lusts. There's a lot more that we could say about this. This is a real issue today. The seventh condition is for Christ to abide in us. As 1 John 3, 24 says, We know by this that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. So that's the teaching I was referring to earlier. And John agrees with Paul on this, that when we have the Spirit, we have Christ. When we have Christ, we have the Spirit. Are you willing for Jesus to live in your life? Then the Holy Spirit will be in you. In John 14, Jesus says, I will pray the Father and He will give you the Spirit of truth. He dwells with you and will be in you. In that day you'll know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. So, The Spirit of God is what brings Jesus in. It's not what keeps Jesus around me. It's what brings Jesus in my life. That's why Jesus said in chapter 16 that it would be to their advantage if he left because when he left, he would be closer to them than when he was with them. The positional difference is the key. Being with somebody is not the same as being in somebody. It's much more intimate, and that's exactly what would happen through the Holy Spirit with Jesus Christ. And the last one is praying together. And I'm going to talk about this one much more this afternoon, praying together. And you know, Acts 1.14, wait for the promise of the Father, Then they returned to Jerusalem, and they went up into the upper room. And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. They continued with one accord. I think that's the key. We're going to see that this afternoon. Ellen White has a very interesting uh, statement that says there's much more power to be expected and obtained when we pray together than when we pray alone. So we'll examine that this afternoon. And so that's exactly what the disciples did. When the day of Pentecost then had fully come, they were all in one accord, in one place, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you more about the revolution that I've experienced when I was pastor of this church many years ago who decided to actually do that kind of uh, simple obedience and says, well, let's just do what God said. What a concept. Let's just go do what God says. See what happens. Amazing things happen in that church as a result of that. So to review, deep repentance, trust in His Word, obedience, a burden to share, persistent intercession, honor the body temple for Christ to abide in our lives and praying together. Each of these are conditions that facilitate the coming of the Spirit of Christ in your life to empower you, to change you,
to move you, to, to uh, bring you closer to being in the image of Christ. Um, I know our time is up. Let me just close with a quick story. I've been trying to go as fast as I could. Um, when I was a pastor, and even when I taught here at Southern, every once in a while I would get, I would go into um, personal retreats. It's not a bad idea for pastors to do and for public people to do. In those personal retreats, I would go away for three or four days. I would go to a cabin. Usually a friend or a church member would have a cabin by a lake or a cabin by, you know, out in the mountains or by the beach or something like that. And I would go with very little food, with my Bible and one or two other books and some music. And that's it. You know, I would mostly fast during that time. I would not see anybody. I would just pray and read and write and pray and meditate. And one time I was by Lake Tahoe, a beautiful place. It was the dead of winter. Uh, so when I arrived to the cabin where I was staying, there were 16 foot high snow drifts. I couldn't get through, you know, it was impossible to see the front door, so I simply went into the second floor, and I went in through a window into the house. I was not about to go walking around too much anyway. It was hard to, you know, there was all of these cabins were empty, all of these people, you know, that whole area. But it was excellent for me because then I was just with Jesus. And I kept praying, Lord, I want to be filled with your spirit. I was just beginning to study these issues in my life. Well, after a couple of days, uh, I decided to take a shower. I hadn't seen anybody, so it was okay if I hadn't taken a shower. So, but I thought, you know, it's time to take a shower. I, uh, but I had a little phlegm here, you know, I was coughing a little bit. And I remember my, my friend of mine saying, the best way to get rid of that is having cold and hot sessions in your shower, you know, so that dislodges that. I said, well, sure, I got plenty of time. Now, typically, when I take a shower, I take three-minute showers. My, my wife loves me. She can use the bathroom for a long time. I go in and out. Uh, but that time, you know, I was not concerned about anybody else needing the bathroom or the shower or worrying about the... The, 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 the hot water, and so I just sang while the water was on my back, and just sang and sang, and I was just happy in Jesus, and it was having a good time, and warm water, you know, I could see the little window up there, freezing cold, covered with snow. I mean, I would touch it, and ooh, man, that's cold. And, um, and then I said, okay, it's time to finish. And uh, I was asking, you know, Lord, fill me with your spirit and so forth. And, and then I decided I'm too chicken to turn the, you know, this from hot to less hot to less hot to less hot. I better do this cold turkey. So I went all the way to the other side. <laughs> About 30 seconds later, Freezing cold water came on my pink shoulders, hot with hot warm water, you know. Hit me so hard like, like a, somebody with a two by four, wham! And I went, <coughs> I couldn't breathe. Literally, I could not breathe. The shock to my system was so great. And it is at that moment... <coughs> that God's Spirit spoke to me. <laughs> he really had my attention and said, when you want me as bad as you want your next breath, you'll have me. Now, I'm not telling you this story so that you may experience that story. I'm telling you this because that's what I needed to understand. And I understood that many times I don't really want God as much as I say I want God or as much as I think I want God. 
And yet, he is so willing to give of himself to me. He says, I am the Lord your God. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. How many of you would like to say, Lord, I want to be filled with your spirit. I want to be filled with your spirit. Father in heaven, thank you for the love of Jesus. Thank you for his presence. Thank you for his promises. Thank you for the willingness of your spirit to come into our lives and to change us from the inside out. Thank you that you have given us clear instructions to facilitate the coming of your spirit in our lives and to not hinder it. Help us, Lord, to be conscious of these things. Help us to cooperate with you so that you may accomplish every and anything you have in mind for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.